that I'm looking forward to. Uh, we have uh, Cisco WebEx here to talk about their production workloads that they are running on, on OpenStack. And to uh, present that for us this morning, we have Reinhard Quelly. Thank you, thank you. When everybody started asking uh, if I was interested in doing a keynote this morning, um, actually it wasn't originally a keynote, it was supposed to be one of those small user sessions where I was a much smaller group. So if I'm nervous, it's because there's a lot of you out there. <laughs> it's very exciting. So um, we are, uh, at WebEx, we actually uh, attended the Design Summit, the Essex Design Summit in October of last year. Um, and we were introduced kind of, my team was introduced to the, to the community and we were inspired by um, stories from CERN and Mercado Libre and some of the other teams that spoke about their experiences. And uh, we were pretty convinced that, uh, that, that participating in this community was a way to deliver what we needed to to, to support our business. And so I was pretty, pretty excited to, to, to launch into that. So when you think about Cisco, let's go forward, that's the wrong forward. Let's not repeat this. Most people, when you think about Cisco, think about this stuff, hardware, CRS routers, switches, uh, UCS gear, um, all great stuff, um, but that's not what our team does. Uh, so at WebEx, we actually deliver and manage SaaS applications. So we deliver um, three primary applications from our platform, WebEx, which most of you are probably familiar with, uh, Jabber, which is an instant messaging um, system, and Cisco Social. Uh, and then there's a bunch of other stuff coming along. And so. Uh, ultimately, we, we actually are one of, this, one of the largest business SaaS vendors uh, in the market today. And so we're serving a lot of users um, with, from this platform. So as we, looked at the, as we looked at our platform and kind of the future of the platform and what we built, WebEx itself as a, as a service has been around for, um, for over a decade, in fact. And so the platform that that was built on, um, while serving its needs well, has not, is, is not the fastest platform for innovation for the future. And so ultimately, what, what do we need to do to get that platform to accelerate our development and, and move things forward? So uh, we do deliver these services from a global footprint. So we'll, we'll hear a lot today about, um, we've heard a lot today about a global footprint just delivering. We actually, our services themselves are run across, uh, across multiple continents themselves. So we call ourselves cloud services because from the, from, the, from the outside world to the outside customer at Cisco, we're a SaaS vendor. We deliver a SaaS application. Um, to end users directly, and we're responsible for delivering that platform. But from inside Cisco, from inside to our other product teams, to the other groups within Cisco, we're, we're effectively a, a cloud provider. We're providing infrastructure, um, platform services, something we call operations as a service, which basically we, we means that we are responsible for the entire stack of the application from the, from the data center tiles all the way up through the running application and managing that. We work. Um, my boss, Raj Patel, has, has coined the term tripod to describe how we work with the other teams. It's uh, product management, engineering, and operations working together to deliver this application. So um, we at, at Cisco, we have multiple cloud teams. And so you can't, you can't throw a stick in Cisco without hitting, hitting cloud somewhere. Um, the, group, the group here uh, that you'll see most around, around the show here is Lou Tucker's uh, OpenStack team. This is the group that actually has... Um, that is delivering OpenStack solutions for customers. You saw some of the announcements earlier, uh, including the OpenStack Cisco edition. Um, we also have a group within our, our, our uh, network management technology group um, that has Cisco Autom Intelligent Automation for Cloud, it's an orchestration framework for the cloud. Uh, we have multiple network teams building uh, quantum plugins and products to work with Cisco. Uh, then we also have internal teams that are using, uh, using OpenStack internally. Our cities team, for example, delivering services to internal users. So, Ultimately, our group, though, um, within our group, we call it drinking our own champagne. Um, we run Cisco on Cisco, so, our, so all of our WebEx services are delivered from Cisco networking gear, and Cisco hardware, lots of Cisco software, and deliver. There's, of course, another name for that, and that's uh, dog fooding. Um, so we get a lot of exposure to, to Cisco, Cisco stuff in the future, um, and, and where, we're, where we're moving from here. So, so one of the questions, you know, as we look out, uh, as we look out about at kind of our deployment platform, our software platform, we have to answer, you know, why, why would we do a cloud? What's, what's, so, what's so interesting about cloud and what are we trying to accomplish? And it's really these things. In fact, um, Mark, um, Mark Shuttle with, with Canonical said this yesterday. I think he hit the nail on the head, which is that ultimately it's about delivering agile operations. How quickly can I deliver applications from development to production in a consistent, um, dependable way? And so ultimately that's like the number one task for us. 
Um, in doing this on top of a of cloud platform and you doing things in the same manner that, that, that our peers in the public cloud community are doing, is we get to reuse all the great tooling out there. Tools like Chef and Puppet, which are commonly used, orchestration frameworks, uh, multiple, multiple uh, you know, logging as a service, metrics as a service, lots of additional things that are available to us to deliver our applications. We get to reuse all that tooling and not reinvent it ourselves, which is key. Um, we actually are very interested in multi-tenancy in the delivery of our services. Even though we're a private cloud um, implementation, uh, multi-tenancy is important to us for some of these reasons. We separate between products, between product lifecycle, QA, dev, production, et cetera. Um, but then also security isolation zones, our network terminization zone, our application zone, our data zones, and those are all separated in tenants within OpenStack, and so we can deliver a, a, a secure service on top of this platform. Um, and then, of course, like any SaaS provider, like anybody delivering an application to the, to the market, we actually have to pay, pay very, very close attention to our cost of goods sold. Um, we do have a free tier of service in WebEx, and uh, it costs to run that, and so we have to keep those prices as low as possible. So, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, Adrian Cockroft has, uh, has famously talked about the private cloud not making any sense. You know, it's like if you're, if you're big enough to run a cloud, you ought, if you're not, you, you ought to be selling cloud services, otherwise you should be running in a public cloud. We have a different opinion of that. We, uh, the number one reason why a private cloud is important to us is accountability. One throat to choke. When I sell, um, many of you are probably Web WebEx customers. When your meeting goes down, it's five minutes after the top of the hour and you're trying to start a meeting. If I were in a public cloud and I had to pick up the phone and call, oh, some large cloud provider who's had a couple outages last month, who do I go to? Who do I say? What's wrong with the network? When's it going to be up? How, how long do I have? Well, we, we need to be able to answer those questions. And so uh, that end-to-end -end accountability is very, very important to us and important to our enterprise customers. End-to-end um, -end visibility. Uh, visibility is actually rather interesting. How many of you would love to be able to go to your cloud provider as an application, as an application developer or deployer and say, tell me exactly what's happening on those VMs. I know what my application is doing. I could see what my application and the metrics are, what are off my application, but I also want to see what the VM is doing. What's the I.O. weight on that VM? What's the load average on that VM? Is it my application or is it the infrastructure? Well, we can answer that question. We can, in fact, expose it to our product teams. So flexibility, we actually are deploying um, clusters from, uh, from clusters in our data centers, and we intend to deploy them out into what we call our IPOPs, or our edge locations, so we can have a common deployment framework across those entire environments, and so being able to have that flexibility across the thing. And then finally, uh, it's an analog world out there, and we connect to it. We have video transcoders, we have telephony bridges, we have all sorts of wacky stuff that have to connect to our services, and if I run my own private cloud, it's very easy for me to make those connections. Well, not easy to make the connections, but it's possible to make the connections. So anyway, why OpenStack specifically? Um, first of all, we're very comfortable with open source. You don't necessarily think of open source in the Cisco world as your first thing, but actually if you look at uh, Jabber, it um, came from a Cisco division, a Cisco group. Uh, the Apache traffic server we contribute to and have, a, have one of the core contributors on our time. We're, we're actually, um, then of course all of Lou's team and the stuff that they're doing, it's, it's a natural way for our organization to actually do business. So we're, we're, there's, uh, there's a level of comfort there and open source of course uh, has a lot of advantages that we can talk about with, uh, with leverage and, and community building and everything else. Um, given also that these things are open source, when we have special needs, we can actually meet those needs immediately. We can apply engineering resources, solve our problems, not wait for that next vendor release. So that's, a, that's another option. So um, the options for support, I think, is uh, self-explanatory. We have a lot of places to go where we can communicate, work with community or outside vendors, um, and then keeping our costs low. So as we decided to go out and say, okay, we've, we've made the decision due to a public cloud, that's a no-brainer for us. Um, probably everybody in the room understands that. Why OpenStack? Okay, we know how, why that's important, but how do we do this? Who do we go to and where do we, where do we start? Keeping in mind that we actually were launching our, our private cloud efforts basically in October of last year, um, we looked out among kind of the community and decided, you know, we, we didn't want to go it completely alone. Uh, we needed someone to help us jumpstart. Um, and we actually turned to two organizations. One is Lou Tucker's OpenStack at Cisco Group, um, and the second was Morantis. And so uh, we've actually been partnering with Morantis in a lot, of, uh, a lot of the things that we've been doing. It's been a very tight partnership. 
one of the key parts of every one of the people on this, on this side that's been important is all of us are committed to keeping the work that we're doing and the extensions that we're making and the deployment we're doing open source. And so that's, uh, in, in fact, everything that we're going to talk about today, um, you either can get right now or will be able to get soon in the OpenStack um, uh, Cisco edition. So everything is, is, is going to be in the public. So, all right. So uh, as we started, okay, we're going we're going, I went out to build a particular, uh, a particular uh, cloud. And uh, rather than try to look at some of our public cloud peers, for example, and look at their service offering and try to decide which parts of those service offerings we want to, uh, want to bite off, we took, a, we took a, a more pragmatic approach. We had a single, a single product team within our group that was actually running in a public cloud at the time. And we implemented the bare minimum that was required to get them running. And so we, we enveloped that application Brought, this, brought the platform up to deliver that application, and now, now we're biting off the next and the next, and so it's a, it's a good approach. One thing that we got asked a lot is, are you gonna support the EC2 API um, within your OpenStack environment? We made a quick call that it just wasn't necessary, wasn't interesting, paid off. The customer, in this case, ported from EC2 API to our API about two days. It just, does, it just doesn't matter, it's not meaningful. Um, so. The, uh, we, we actually, but remember again, we, we, started, we started our kind of OpenStack journey in October of last year. By, by July 31st, we had launched our alpha product on top of that. That is, has everything to do with the strength of the product in the community. I think if everybody, everybody wants to ask, can you, is, is OpenStack ready to deliver applications? You know, you talk here about all the problems we have in OpenStack, all the things that we want to do. The reality is we took this thing effectively off the shelf deployed it in our environment, connected it to our monitoring systems, I'll talk about that in a minute, and launched, launched an application on top of that. So absolutely, it's possible, and this is Essex in this case. So, so yeah, and we've had 100% uptime on that platform since, since that launch. So we are going uh, beta of this particular set of services within, within a few weeks. I was hoping to announce it earlier, but uh, there's always, always road bumps. So uh, just a quick, quick overview of what we are actually uh, providing. Um, so the Nova implementation uh, is, is actually stock Essex in our environment, um, mostly stock Essex. Uh, as we know, when we deploy, and, and this is kind of a, a, a familiar slide to everybody, a controller node controlling us as we have compute nodes. Our compute, our, our infrastructure is Ubuntu. We're running KVM on top of that. Um, standard, standard Nova underneath there. We don't feel like that's, uh, enough to run in a production environment. And so one of the first things that we did was add uh, HA, um, active passive controllers in our environment. Now, if you look at the OpenStack at Cisco work, there, we're, we're heading, screaming towards that active active controller node. Uh, we deployed this again back in July, and so this is, our, this is the first generation of that, so, or an active, uh, uh, active passive environment. But we, do, uh, we have done full failover testing and made sure that this does run. And w one thing to note about us is that we have, instead of thousands of customers or tens of thousands of customers, we have tens of customers because we have, we're delivering to product teams effectively. And so a lot of the scale questions don't necessarily apply to us immediately. Um, so when you deploy things like this, kind of this is, this is where you get, right? You've got, you've got a running system, it's ready to go, you're plowing down the street, but you don't really know where you're going yet. Um, and so one of the immediate things, one of the first things that we have to add to this environment uh, is monitoring and service assurance layers. And so a lot of the work that our own team internally to, to cloud services has done is around monitoring metrics collection, um, alerting, that type of stuff. And so our, we have a full, basically a full stack of, of, of monitoring metrics collection, uh, CollectD and StatsD on the metrics collection. Uh, we use uh, Flume for log forwarding into our central logging ser servers, um, Monit and MSIND for local process health and alerting. All of these things connect back to our back end, uh, to our existing uh, infrastructure services, MCT and EMS, which are internal alerting and, um, and uh, health check systems, respectively. We've also created a management console that, that, uh, that kind of percolates up some of, these, uh, some of these things into these monitoring views. So you can kind of at a glance see your health check uh, the status of the cluster as whole, red, green, blue, uh, blue meaning uh, in maintenance or, or act. Um, and then, uh, of course, metrics and monitoring. These metrics, uh, through the work, again, Lou's team has done, uh, can actually be um, exported and brought up into the horizon interface as well, if you choose not to use that single point of interface. One point I want to make on these, on these monitoring views is that we give our tenants, our customers, 
access to these as well. So they can, they can see our underlying platform as well as their applications, and we're piping the metrics from both into the same place. Um, and so that we can look at, the, look at the system holistically. One of the major advantages of private cloud, frankly. Um, so basically we did the same thing for Swift. Swift is a big part of our environment um, and, uh, and all of the, uh, all the metrics and management layer. The one, the one thing that's slightly different about Swift is that, is that we, we have added an orchestration layer based on uh, SALT in this case that allows us to sequence things. Um, I, I should have mentioned earlier that everything that you're looking at here is automatically managed and deployed through Puppet scripts um, and uh, systems are booted with Cobbler, configured with Puppet, brought up, so it's hands-off deployments from plugging in a box, enter the MAC address in Cobbler and you're done. This whole system comes up all the way up to there, including RAID configuration and everything else. So. Uh, we do run, as you saw in our previous slide, we always run in multiple data centers. Um, we live in California. The earth shakes out here regularly. We have data centers in, in, in uh, Texas. The tornadoes go through there regularly. To, to provide a 7 by 24 or 365, you have to have multiple data centers. So we, our approach on multiple data centers for Swift, for, uh, for Swift is effectively what we have today, which is two Swift clusters with container level replication between those. We're powerfully interested in the multi-data center work that uh, this, the Marantia Swift SAC, our team, uh, the community at large is working on. It's gonna be very important to keeping those costs down because this means three plus three on copies and so we need to, we need to solve that. On the, on the Nova side, however, we actually intentionally separate out those clusters. Uh, it's our belief that application availability um, is an application layer problem and that the applications are designed to understand those just as when you deploy into a, an Amazon environment, for example, you're explicitly talking to an Amazon East endpoint and an Amazon West endpoint. Well, we, that enables you as an application developer to make decisions about how your data is flowing, how your traffic is flowing, how your replication is flowing if you use replication. You need to, we need to expose that to the customer, to our customer, which is our tenant, so that they can make intelligent decisions about that application design because the network does not have zero latency. It's not always up. All of the fallacies, uh, there was a Sun fellow who had a list of fallacies of network computing that you can live by <laughs> and, uh, and you have to expose these things to the user. So we actually, in our, in our Swift environment, I mean our Nova environment, I'm sorry, we do, uh, we do explicitly expose multiple endpoints. We do replicate, the only thing we replicate between the two at the, at the infrastructure layer is in fact uh, users and tenants credentials so that they can use the same credentials across both. But. Anyway, so that's uh, one of the things that, uh, again, we, we deployed this originally in, in July, we're continuing forward. Um, we have, we are deployed using the standard VLAN uh, networking model. This is a model that, that, that doesn't work particularly well for uh, lar enormous, you know, large public providers who have thousands or tens of thousands of clients, but when I've got tens of clients, the limits on VLANs are, are not a problem. Um, so I, I don't, the number of VLANs per network, for example, is just, it's manageable for us. It does give us a, an interesting capability that we've actually taken advantage of in our deployments thus far, and that is the ability to drop a physical host into a customer's VLAN. So we have certain, certain um, servers, for example, that run best on hardware, um, and there's no reason why I can't deploy those right alongside the, the virtual servers that a tenant is spinning up and give them direct access to each other. And so that's actually proved, uh, pr proved pretty, pretty valuable for us right now. Uh, we are, of course, uh, very interested in quantum and the things we can do, particularly as we try to extend this model across multiple data centers. But, uh, but for now, this is, this is working out very well for us. So, so if you talk about that, that combined team and what we've done together, um, the first is, again, deployment and monitoring. It's uh, if you can't deploy reliably, repeatably, quickly, uh, you, you don't have much of a cloud. You've got you to be able to build that infrastructure underneath your growth um, reliably, and you've got to be able to monitor and watch it. So, so this, is, this is a big chunk of work we've been doing. The HA configuration around MySQL and RabbitMQ. Uh, all of our services, by the way, um, uh, are all API endpoints. We, being Cisco, know a few things about load balancers. We use external load balancers to deliver traffic into, into all these systems, and so we use that existing infrastructure for that, and don't try to repeat it in the client. Uh, so on Swift, we've actually done a few uh, API extensions that are interesting for our particular use cases, specifically secure token access, where we can actually hand out, uh, um, we don't have to have individual per end customer credentials to access data in Swift. We can hand out signed timed tokens that will give them access for a very brief period of time. Um, cryptographic hashes for some of the data we're putting in. The MD5 hashes are not strong enough for our use case, and so we actually are doing um, 
uh, I think SHA-512 um, hashes on those uh, to, to, to know what data we're putting in and ensure that it hasn't been tampered and along the way. We're doing uh, um, the ring management uh, via Puppet and uh, SALT for mode execution. Um, and the multi-part upload, which is uh, for handling these large objects. All those are, are the things. And uh, again, all these things are things that you can expect to see in the OpenStack uh, uh, Cisco edition. So um, we have, uh, again, with our partners, uh, Mirantis, we've extended, extended the Tempest test to run full validation. So when we deploy a new data center, for example, and we're standing up a new Swift cluster, um, rather than just do the functional level tests or ad hoc tests, we're actually running Tempest tests that have been extended to do functional tests. So spin up VMs ensure we can log in, tear them down, connect to the database, basically give a better exercise of the whole system. Those are intended to run in production as well, so we can continue to run them against a runtime system. So, um, And then uh, this last one I'll talk about a little bit in more detail is that uh, one of the interesting things about running a private cloud is, is uh, workload placement becomes very interesting for you. If you're, if you're deploying into a public cloud with tens of thousands of physical nodes, Random works very well for workload placement in terms of disperse, getting dispersion of your workload so your, all of your front end nodes don't go down at once, for example. If I've got handfuls of physical servers in some small data center or IPOP, for example, I have to be very careful about where I place those workloads. Um, and so a lot of the things that we're kind of looking at for the future is, is around the scheduler and, and how we manage the workloads in this environment. And one of the first things that we had was around Nova volume. So a Nova volume, as we know, is a, it's an iSCSI-based protocol. The, if you have a Nova, ser Nova volume server, um, typically is a, a Nova volume server is a separate box and exporting via iSCSI to the compute nodes, we actually thought, well, what if we could take Nova volume and distribute it across all of our compute nodes and then when we actually create a volume, create effectively anti-affinity groups to create those volumes, a group of volumes, and say, I want you to disperse yourself across all the available servers. So that works out pretty well. So you can actually create these distributed volumes. So if you think about, for example, a, uh, a Cassandra or a Voldemort or a React or a whatever cluster, you want those disks in that cluster to be spread across multiple physical machines. The next step of that is actually to have a, a, a scheduler in the in the Nova side that's actually aware of where those volumes are and can try to get itself as close to the volume as possible. So when you spin up a VM, you say, I want you to get as adjacent to this particular volume ID as possible. So it's kind of a, kind of a cool way to, to get local performance but still the benefits of local volume, of uh, Nova volume. So anyway. Um, Changing gears just a little bit here, uh, you know, as, a, as a, anybody deploying a new application, a new software package, you, you, do, documentation is a big deal. Engineers, by and large, that's not their first thing on their mind when they're delivering features, is delivering documentation for those features. And so it's always a chore to manage, to manage documentation. We've done quite a bit. This is actually a snapshot of our internal wiki page. Um, that's actually a joint Cisco wiki page across the multiple cloud teams that are doing work. Um, but it actually doesn't stop there. Our users, in fact, when we delivered our first application, I will admit that I actually didn't point them to my own documentation. I pointed them to one of our public cloud competitors who's running OpenStack and said, use their libraries and their documentation. They're ahead of us. And so that's what they did. They actually took, the, they took our competitors' products and our competitors' documentation and built their application using the APIs as documented and just pointed at our endpoint and away it goes. So we get to use a lot of, there's a lot of stuff out there that our product teams can use that we can leverage without having to write ourselves or hire documentation people ourselves. OpenStack Foundation, local meetup groups that are active in this stuff, the public clouds, including our competitors, um, the uh, various web forums, uh, fellow users in various groups. There's a lot of material out there that makes this stuff uh, very, very approachable for customers. So the, uh, as we look towards the future, some of the things that we're going to be doing here um, uh, that are very interesting to us, and there's been some discussions around this, uh, this summit, and we'll continue these questions. Uh, first of all is at-rest encryption. We have, a, we have a, uh, again, use case and need for, doing, um, for encrypting data um, in our data center for our customers. Uh, Multi-data center Swift, which I, which I mentioned earlier. Uh, we have an internal identity system um, that's used across our product lines and uh, connecting uh, using um, Connecting our authorization, it's actually pretty straightforward with Keystone, right? Connecting to that back end to an alternate authentication mechanism. Uh, of course, quantum, as we, as we um, kind of extend our networking and our capabilities of, uh, particularly as we go to multi-data center, uh, these are some of the areas. 
Uh, Medal of Service is the thing that's particularly interesting to us, and there has been a lot of a lot of conversations in this summit about different groups actually using the OpenStack API as a front end to de delivering and managing um, th that, those physical servers. And ultimately, the goal for us in that case is is to give the application teams a common interface. They don't have to change their deployment, their their methodology, um, in order to specify a, a a physical server versus a versus a uh, virtual, and there's a lot of use cases for, for those physical servers. Things like Hadoop, for example, work best on, work best on for physical. If we can manage them in the same way that we can manage our, uh, that we can manage our uh, virtual infrastructure is a win for everybody. So, and then ongoing uh, operability stuff. So, I'm just screaming along here, so I'll finish early, which you guys will probably all appreciate. So, that was it. Um, so, we are, of course, hiring. <laughs> is anybody not hiring? <laughs> and. Uh, this is the general uh, Cisco landing page for hiring, and uh, there, if you stop by the Cisco booth in the back corner, we uh, definitely have, uh, there's, some, uh, there's some cards and you can talk to people about, about some of the stuff that we have there. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Reinhardt. I, uh, I think maybe we started something bad here with this hiring. <laughs> I live in the country in, in East Texas, and there are lots of woods and farms and ranches, and a lot of times you'll drive by and you'll see on the fences signs that say, posted, no poaching. <laughs> We're probably going to start to see some of those out there in the, uh, in the sponsor areas. So that wraps it up for our keynotes this morning. Um, thank you guys for, for coming. A lot of sessions throughout the day. Check sked.org. And, um, and we're going to be doing a, a, a breakdown on this room. So, um, so you can all leave now. Thank you very much. Yeah.